good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> uh, I am uh, Ken Bill Lok, you know, the interim director of uh, IES. I'm really excited you know, to see you all here. Uh, today, I uh, have the pleasure you know, of introducing uh, this, our speaker, uh, Professor Sir Chris Pizaretis. Sir Chris is our IAS uh, Helmut and Anna Paul Solman Professor at Large. Uh, professor uh, Pizaretis received his uh, PhD in economies in 1973 from the London School of uh, economics, and uh, he has been on the faculty since okay, 1976. Uh, he is uh, the uh, richest uh, uh, professor of uh, economics there. Uh, professor not the Pizaretis has uh, served on many influential uh, committees. So I'm going to just okay, uh, you know, uh, name a, a few. So in uh, uh, 20, uh, 2011, uh, he was the president of the European Economic uh, Association. Uh, he has served as the external member of the Monetary Policy Committee of uh, the Central Bank of uh, Cyprus, uh, which brought you know, the, the euro you know, to, to Cyprus. Uh, he has also been a consultant of the European Commission, the World Bank, and OECD on matters related to employment and macroscopic macroeconomic no policy. Uh, he has okay, published okay, the, um, many articles in professional journals, magazines, and also the press. Uh, his book, Equilibrium and Employment Theory, is a classic note in the economic of unemployment. Uh, he is frequently quoted in the press on issues concerning the Eurozone and the future of European integration. So Chris Lok has received you know, the, uh, numerous you know, awards. So I'm going to just okay, again uh, name two. Uh, he co-shared you know, the 2010 Nobel Memorial Prize of, in Economic you know, Sciences for his work in the economics of labor markets, especially you know, his work on markets with frictions and unemployment. In 2005, he became you know, the first European economist winning you know, the ICA Prize in Labor uh, Economies. Economics, sorry. Uh, in recognition of uh, his uh, superior you know, accomplishments, Professor Pesaridis has been elected as a fellow of uh, the British Academy, the Academy of Athens, the Academy Academia uh, Europea, and a lifetime memory, mem uh, honorary members of the American Economic Association. In 2011, uh, he received you know, the Grand Cross of the Republic of Cyprus, which is you know, the highest honor of you know, the Republic. Uh, he was knighted by Queen Elizabeth, Elizabeth II in 2013. Uh, today, Professor Pizaritis will share you know, his insight on how you know, automation technology will impact you know, the future of work and whether you know, okay, we, sh we would uh, worry about you know, okay, artificial uh, intelligence. So, okay, get ready to be inspired and also be challenged. So now, okay, the, let's join me in giving the uh, professor of the uh, Pizaritis, okay, the warm welcome. I thank you very much, uh, Kampiu. I'm especially pleased to see all of you here. Uh, welcome to uh, Mr. Helmut and uh, Anna Paul Solman, very pleased to see you, president of the university, of course. Dear friends, students, colleagues, and so on, thank you all for being here. My topic is uh, one that uh, has occupied me for uh, quite a while now. 
In fact, the family here who are giving me stress seeing them in front more than any, anyone else of you here, <laughs> because I'm going to hear the real criticism tonight. <laughs> and she claims that she heard it many, many times before, but in fact, I guarantee you every time I give this lecture, I, I add at least 25% of the material is new. <laughs> and, uh, the, a, a, lot, a lot of what I'm going to say actually is based on a, a project that I'm um, directing in uh, London. I think I've listed it here on the, uh, this one here, which to give me even more stress, the NAFI Foundation that is funding it said, no, no, it has to be called the Pissaridis Review so that we tie you down to producing something good. <laughs> and, uh, it's about the future of work and well-being in, uh, in, in Britain. And the questions that um, we're asking are um, these over here, that uh, we know that automation technologies in robotics and AI are bringing a lot of changes to labor markets. And the question is uh, how are workers in industrial countries affected, you know, Britain in particular, but the things I'm going to say are more general. Um, uh, then how is the industrial structure of the country affected? and uh, whether the situation can be improved, and if so, how? And especially paying particular attention to um, how workers respond to these technologies, because they seem to be panicking, it's giving them mental health issues, uh, other problems. I'm working with uh, uh, medical uh, researchers, in fact, to see how we can deal with the health issues and uh, uh, as well as the economic issues that were being faced. I don't know how much time we have uh, to deal with these uh, problems here, but uh, I'd be more than happy if something I haven't dealt with to uh, take it up question time later. I've been um, instructed to talk for about an hour, which sounds like a lot, a lot of time to me, but I hope I, I keep your attention and then you get the chance to uh, ask questions. So the topics I'm going to address is, first of all, I'm going to ask about uh, technology and the main impact that it has on labor market trends, current. Then, um, very briefly, because I don't want to spend too much time on this, how much, um, how many, uh, how, how much penetration has there, have, has there been so far from robotics and uh, artificial intelligence? And what do we know about their impact? The answer is so little that I'm not going to have many slides. There isn't much to say as yet. Um, then I'm going to talk about uh, the, the replacement of uh, activities or tasks, as the literature calls them now, uh, about uh, how they're replacing labor in many activities. And um, then the question of whether are we now suffering from job shortage? Uh, or are we suffering from worker shortage? If, if they're replacing workers, then of course there should be a job shortage. But we'll have to wait and see. And then the issue that we're especially currently paying a lot of attention uh, in Britain, what skills are we going to need for the future? And, and um, students in particular, you'd be surprised actually by what skills uh, we need for the future. For the majority of, uh, of us, they are pretty easy to acquire. So just cheer up <laughs> when, you, when you hear that robots might take your jobs. <laughs> and, um, and finally, just very briefly on the issue that I'm becoming more and more interested in, in fact, how we can improve the well-being of workers, given uh, what they're suffering uh, currently from misinformation and fake news more than anything else. Uh, okay, let's start with um, the technology. I'm afraid I, I, I have the habit of writing lots of things on slides, main, mainly for my benefit, in case I forget what I'm talking about uh, or where I am. You, you don't need to read everything if you hear. I'm going to be briefer than what's on the slides. Um, now, we, now, we know that in industrial countries, in particular in advanced countries, growth, you know, economic progress, can only take place through technologies to production, through new technologies to production. I mean, if you look at China in 1980, obviously it didn't need technology to grow. In fact, it didn't use technology to grow until 2010, 15, because you can reform an economy, you can turn it into a market economy, give incentives to people to work, and they're going to work. Human beings respond to incentives. 
But if you look at industrial uh, countries, advanced countries, then you need the new technology. Now, historically, if you look at uh, the, uh, any technological discovery, you can say that it automated some kind of activity. In other words, some kind of activity that was done by human hands, it's now done with the help of machinery or by machinery alone. Um, it's surprising that if you look back to uh, the first industrial revolution in Britain, that, that's what you find, you know, like it, it's capital replacing labor all the time. Um, and what's uh, more interesting than I discovered in writing slides, in fact, is that, um, is that industrial revolutions have been um, caused by something that increased the power that we can apply, sort of replacing muscle power and, and providing much more power to drive machinery. You know, steam, for example, was the basis of the first industrial revolution. You know, like, uh, whereas before, people worked on making things with, uh, with their hands, with their limited capabilities, uh, steam engines initially covered half of this room, and they were very, very powerful. You were driving trains, ships, you know, that kind of, of thing. And the internal combustion, is, it didn't quite cause a revolution, but but it did help a lot in that um, machinery could um, burn within itself the, the, the fuel rather than uh, externally. Electricity, in my view, was the biggest industrial revolution of all. And uh, in this I've been influenced by Bob Gordon of Northwestern University who wrote extensively about it. But, but I think it is if you think about what impact it had on uh, on production, and of course, electricity was even more powerful than steam. And uh, finally, computers, and you might say, well, where is the power that computers use? Well, it's the power to do calculations. It's mental power rather than physical with computers. And, uh, and that's a big one, but um, you know, the people who deal with AI, they say, oh, there's never been anything as big as AI in the whole of human history. In fact, so far, I guarantee you electricity is bigger. You could, um, you, you could live, we could easily live in our cities in a world without AI, but we could not live in a world without electricity. And that's the ultimate test, is what, what do you need to live rather than uh, what do you need to do other exciting things. Um, now, have we lost uh, jobs? Well, economists pay too much attention to job loss and the media take even more attention and that's what is giving stress to um, workers and, and people who listen to them. But in fact, it's not even, it's, it's not the main challenge for new technologies, how to save jobs. In fact, we should never try to save jobs from new technologies. What we should be, what the challenge is and what we should be working on is how to make sure that workers transition from the old technologies to the new technologies and become productive very, very quickly. And that's what I'm going to focus here. I don't care how many jobs would be lost. As many jobs would be created again. That's what history, economic history te uh, t tells us. And, uh, and of course, the first person to say that was uh, Joseph Schumpeter, the Austrian economist, by, by the way. Um, well, I don't know. I mean, Americans are claiming, claiming him on, as their own, but Americans do have a habit of claiming European economists as their own once they move to America. Um, you know, Einstein included. <laughs> um, and he called it creative destruction. He's, and he described it as the essence of capitalism. Uh, new technologies destroy, they destroy a lot, but also they create new opportunities. Now, Schumpeter talked about whole jobs, but in fact, it, it's, it's a little bit misleading actually to say whole, whole jobs. What, what new technologies do is that they destroy sets of activities uh, in some parts of the economy. And what he's saying, don't try to preserve them, let them be destroyed, because that's going to free up resources, especially human resources, to go and learn the new activities that these technologies will give uh, birth to. And that's the whole idea of um, the transition of workers being the, um, being the challenge. You know, it's all very well to uh, let the creative destruction take place, and we should do, following 
this and subsequent views that's been very influential, in fact, this view. Um, but Schumpeter didn't talk about how do we make workers uh, take on the new uh, activities. You know, he, he sort of assumed that they leave one place and go on to another, but there is a kind of friction in between, which is what, where our work uh, with um, my uh, course uh, comes in. Now, the reason for these transitions and the reason that we observe this creative destruction is that technological progress um, is unbalanced. It, it, it doesn't take the whole economy and move it up, which is the um, sort of ingenious model of Robert Solo, those of you who, uh, try economic, uh, who, who studied economics uh, assumed. It, it's good to start with this solo type model to begin with, it's balanced growth, but remember that growth is unbalanced always, and that's why we have these problems of uh, create this creative, creative destruction and uh, uh, transitions of, uh, of workers. And, and what we mean by unbalanced is that technology is affecting a section of the economy, that economy becomes much more productive, the prices of the goods it produces go down, but usually, even with lower, lower prices, we cannot buy everything that it produces. It produces too much. And because it produces too much, the only way to stop this overproduction is to uh, send workers away from those activities and um, send them to do something else where there is demand. Uh, recently, the prices, the uh, technological developments are digital. They affect mainly uh, computers, the, 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 um, digital uh, equipment, and you can see it here. I mean, look at, I, I thought I would show one representative price, and that's the price of a portable Apple computer. It was invented in 1989. In fact, it was so heavy, I don't think any one of us can carry it easily nowadays, <laughs> now that we know how, how, how heavy uh, computers are. The, the first portable Apple computer was about as heavy as the current desktop. Of, of, of Apple, and it sold for uh, $14,800 in nominal terms, so it's a lot of you know, US dollars, of course, not Hong Kong dollars. Right? By 91, it, it dropped down. Then the biggest technological developments in the portable Apple computer took place between 91 and 2001. That's why the price even went up a little. These, these prices are not corrected for uh, quality adjustments. But look what happened in the 2000s. Now it's selling in the States at least, for one, 2015, 1,379, I guess now it would be even less. And it's a much, much more powerful and better machine than, than the top one. That's because of technological progress. But then you, you, don't, you don't need the, the people to work to be producing these uh, machines all the time because productivity goes up. Now, if you look, and, and this is quite, quite important, if you, if you look at the big picture of, of what are the most important industrial revolutions that took place. There's no doubt that the first and most important of all is the green revolution in agriculture. I mean, to, to begin with in history until fairly recently, the vast majority of people, you know, 75, 80% in China until uh, 1978, in fact, um, in Britain up to about 1700, they were employed in agriculture. Something happens in agriculture, it becomes more productive. You know, in China, it was probably the household responsibility system that gave incentives to people to um, produce more rather than uh, producing and giving it to their local government. And um, because they produce more food, we cannot consume more and more food once we reach a certain level, and that frees workers to go and work in industry. Then the first industrial revolution comes along, uh, in the old days, it was the factory system, steam power. Now it's uh, something similar, you know, again, factories, offices, and, uh, and electricity. And that releases labor as well. So manufacturing would first go up as the agricultural workers come into manufacturing, and then it would go down. And where do they go? They go into services. Have we had a service revolution? No very, very minor. Services need more people, and they're attracting all the time. So 
given the sort of big picture revolutions that we've had, you would um, expect to see services, you would expect to see our economies to become service economies and almost everyone be employed in the services, whereas the machinery uh, works on uh, agriculture and, uh, and, and industry. And that's what we have in uh, the more advanced countries like US, UK, uh, Western Europe, Germany, and so on. Now, uh, what do we do? Well, if we want to buy more and more agriculture and manufacturing goods, we get growth just by producing more. But, but we don't, as a rule. You know, we, we don't want to overeat. Uh, we don't produce it and give it to poorer countries, which would have been a good thing to do, but we just don't do it. Um, manufacturing goods, there are also limits. How many cars can you have? How many washing machines? There's, you reach a limit where you just buy replacement goods. And, um, but with services, there is no limit to how much you can consume because y y you don't store them in a way. I mean, it's a little bit like food where it's almost unlimited how many uh, services uh, you can take. They're, they're non-storable. So you could be employing the same, pers same person day, day in, day out, supplying you the service and you don't uh, end up uh, overeating with services. You just, you know, it's fun. You can have as many massages as you want and you still enjoy them, you know. Oops, something, I pressed the wrong button. Where is he? That's it, we came back. Uh, okay, now, do we reach, do we reach saturation? It's what I just said, we don't, how don't we reach saturation? Well. Look, I mean, you can travel more for pleasure. You can go to more restaurants instead of eating at home. You can get personal trainers, helpers, go to doctors, beauticians more frequently, being looked after by nurses when you don't feel well instead of your grandmother. It, it, this, this kind of activities create jobs in the services and employ people. Uh, now look at the company sector. Companies use specialist services to enhance their productivity, like management consultants, financial advisors, logistic advisors, etc. The British economy, in fact, is, uh, is, is built on the, the last type of service, so business services. You know, the big accountancy firms, financial services, and so on. And, and that's where jobs, that's why we'll never run out of jobs. There is demand for those jobs all the time. Um, and, of course, the reason that uh, they, they will always be created is that um, we don't have any labor-saving technologies in those. With, with the exception of very, very recent uh, AI, actually, I'm going to talk about ChatGPT, which is replacing some of these jobs, but uh, no, nowhere near to the extent that we might run out. Um, they are what you might describe person-to-person -person services, which would be rising, their prices would be rising because there's no technology, and it's quite a normal development that we're seeing, manufacture, relative manufacturing prices falling, relative food prices falling, unless Russia disrupts supply, <laughs> supply chains of food, but that's temporary, hopefully. And um, the um, price of service is rising all the time, which, uh, I think it's related to what we call in economics the Bommel cost disease, although I might be told off by that by someone sitting at the front here, yeah, but, but I think it's related to, is that correct? Oh no, all right, take that back. Um, and that's how we end up in the US and, and, and UK with 80% employment in services, providing this person-to-person -person, uh, service. Um, now, are there any risks in the service economy? Well, I think the only risk actually is from AI, AI problem, but nowhere, we're nowhere near. Um, and I mean, I don't want to agree with Elon Musk, this would be ridiculous, but, <laughs> but when he came to London during the London summit last uh, November, he, he said to the UK Prime Minister that, that um, eventually the AI would be able to do all the service jobs with very, very few exceptions. And so if we want, we can give up work altogether. Um, even, uh, even, the, even the prime minister didn't agree with him and explain why. It was one of the very, very few uh, wise statements that the 
British Prime Minister ever made, actually. <laughs> I, I, I think he would be better at that job than, uh, than governing the country after the next general election, anyway. <laughs> Hopefully, fingers crossed. Um, the, but, but right now, it's not. Even, even Elon Musk said it would be in the dis distant future rather than now. Um, all right, so given that um, we're going to uh, live with the service economy for a long time, uh, what, what do we need to know to um, succeed in this transition that we are going through? First, uh, we have to ask, you know, what skills do workers require for that? And that's what we're trying to find out, in fact, in London. How can we improve worker well-being and not just uh, make the transitions to get more profit, which is happening a lot, in fact, because inequalities are, are growing. Um, how can we achieve an inclusive and sustainable growth? Is the environmental question, is the gender inequality, uh, racial inequality, that's the inclusiveness part. And if you ask, well, are there any good examples of countries that have succeeded in that? Well, just a few small European countries have, do, have done it. At least they have done much more than the bigger countries. That's uh, Sweden, Denmark, Netherlands, uh, Finland to some to a lesser extent. But the, of, of the bigger countries, actually, the one that is closer to this is probably Germany. Although when I say it in front of Germans, they say to me, that's because you don't know Germany well enough, and that's why you're saying it. But if you look at the statistics, half statistics, I think Germany is much closer to this than, than Britain or the United States. And Japan, although I, I don't know Japan that well, actually, it's just to uh, Europe and North America. Now, many, many people, though, are saying that this time is different. And in fact, what I mentioned from Elon Musk, it, it's related to that. And um, that got me thinking, you know, is, is it really different this time, or is it just every time we think it's different? And um, if you look at, at the kind of number of jobs and the, and the transitions that we have, I, I, I thought there is no evidence that it's different this time with, with digital technologies. Where there might be some evidence that it's different is in the, if you like, in the distance that workers need to travel. You see, like if you leave, I mean, just think of China in the 1980s. If you leave agriculture as an unemployed, as a unskilled worker, and you come to industry to work as an unskilled worker, it's not much of a jump. All you need to do is move to an urban location and you carry on working in an unskilled way. Um, the same if you were working with steam and now you need to work with electricity. It, it's not a big uh, transition that you are taking. But if you're working, say, in an office with, um, without a computer and do things manually and you keep your data manually and you process it on a calculator or, or even a basic computer, and then suddenly all this new technology comes along, like AI and uh, more sophisticated uh, software for uh, data storage and processing. You, you do need to learn a lot more things. And, and that's the only difference that I could find. That the, if you measure the distance that you, along a skills dimension that you have to travel to be able to perform with the new technologies, with, with these technologies, you have to travel further. You need more training, in other words. And that's what we need to think about. How do we provide this training? Um, to uh, succeed. All right, let me talk briefly how much uh, use do we have of robots and, and AI? Now, first looking at robots, the, um, ro recently we, we, do, we do have some robots being applied in the services, especially restaurants, actually, and uh, transportation. Shop, I put shops, but I don't think it's very much in shops. You know, like cleaning robots in hospitals, you have the hotels we have here, you have robots cleaning up tables, you know, they go around tables, you put your plate there and, and they go away. Um, but uh, that, that's a very, very tiny minority. About 90% of robots are employed in manufacturing. And not only that, they, they do just one thing, they, they handle heavy weights. And um, 
they uh, were employed mainly in the uh, transport equipment, you know, making cars, and um, in the electronics, uh, assembling chips. That's basically what robots do. No, nothing much more than that. Uh, but that, in that respect, they are very widespread. Uh, Korea, Japan, and Germany are the leaders, the main industrial countries that employ robots. But currently, China is installing more robots than the rest of the world put together. So its uh, manufacturing will be robotized very soon. Within 10 years, actually, China will, will just be using robots in its manufacturing. Um, and um, do we... Do we have evidence that robots take our, our jobs? These are the things that uh, is, it seems obvious, and economists are usually very, very good at discovering obvious things, but in fact, we haven't been able to discover this one. If you look at the economics literature on whether robots take human jobs, you will not find any kind of consensus at all. If you do it one way, then robots are replacing labor. You do it another way, robots are comp complementing labor. And, um, and it's becoming a sort of, it's becoming a little bit of an unfashionable topic to research anymore. So I don't think we're ever, economists were ever going to, they're they, they ever going to agree, they're ever going to reach consensus of what robots do to, to, to work. What most people believe, including myself actually, without having too much evidence for it, is this, uh, this point down here that um, if you look at the whole world, then robots must be taking jobs from humans. You know, like think of an assembly line in a car. You, you know, I don't know if, if, if many of you have, might, might be showing my age, but it was before my time. I should let you know. Do you ever see this, uh, the Charlie Chaplin movie called uh, Modern Times? They were all standing along and they were just going like this. Now there's nothing. Now it's robots that go like that. Well, obviously, all those people that were working with with Charlie Chaplin, they, they've lost their jobs. So it cannot be that robots don't take any jobs. So that's the idea that if you look at the whole of manufacturing worldwide, then robots do take your jobs. But then if you look at individual companies or even countries, when they install robots, their productivity rises, and therefore they're able to compete more effectively and steal jobs from other companies. And, and I think that's why economic research cannot differentiate between the two. And uh, I can show you this. I'm, I'm good. I, if there are any students, don't think that this is the way to do empirical work, but I can get away with it. All right. <laughs> Just look at four observations. <laughs> look at the, the, the pink bars is the installation of robots in manufacturing by these four industrial countries. And the blue is the change in their employment over the same period of time. And you can see Britain is the slowest country to adopt robotics. And uh, Germany and Japan are the ones that did it the fastest. Well, Germany basically wiped out uh, UK manufacturing within the European Union. It's one of the reasons, in fact, that Brexit got so much support. A kind of Trump-like idea that uh, vote for me and I'll bring the, your jobs back from China kind of thing. <laughs> Of course, Trump cannot do it, and I don't think the British Tories can do it either. Um, France is second, and it lost uh, fewer. Uh, Japan comes next, and Germany, that installed most robots, hasn't lost any. Now, if you ask why is that the case, you, you only need to look at the export markets. What these countries have done, Germany and Japan, is that they've stolen jobs from uh, Britain, France, and, and, and many other industrial countries. And, Especially if, if, you sort of, if you just look at the European countries that operated within the single European market, it, it's obvious what happened. I mean, Germany is the only exporter in Europe. The others, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there, but not manufacturing goods. Uh, you know, Britain is exporting more services, actually, than sort of business services and manufacturing. So that, that, that's the idea behind it of what uh, robots do. Um, now, now China, I don't know, I'm saying something. I, I, I wanted to say something because it, it, it's a, in a little bit different situation in that about 30% of the labor force is still employed in manufacturing. 
Now, of course, China cannot discover even more export markets to export. I mean, this is, they were saturated with uh, Chinese goods, and now it's, it's becoming totally uh, technology-driven. They're, they're applying more and more technology to their manufacturing, so it's bound to lose jobs on the basis of the principle uh, that I pointed out before. It still has about uh, 15, in fact, some say 20 percent. I just forgot Wikipedia. Wikipedia claims that there are 20 percent uh, of, of Chinese employment is in agriculture, but I think that's probably a little bit too high if you do it properly. Um, and that's mainly the hookah system that is keeping them in, in, in agriculture. But it's, it's incredibly inefficient, though. It produces only 7 percent of GDP, and it employs more than twice the 7 percent. So efficiency per person in agriculture is less than half of what uh, it is in manufacturing in China. Uh, so it needs to find other jobs for these workers. So the biggest challenge that it's facing is how to develop a service sector to absorb them, which, uh, of course, is not going to do. I mean, look at UK and, um, and, China, uh, and um, American manufacturing compared with the Chinese. They were at about the same level in 1980. And uh, since then, Chinese has been rising and rising. And the US, UK falling, now they're down to 10%, only 10% of the labor force employed in manufacturing in Britain and America. But it's still about 30% in China. And that's, and that's going to be a big problem. It's, um, it, it's one of the problems that was discussed at the recent China Development Forum when I was there, but without coming up with any solutions other than just general statements. Um, now, what about AI? Well, AI, it, it's, it's not used at work still, but if you look at surveys of, of employers, they, about 80% of them will say that they're applying AI in their uh, operations. But I think what they're applying is something very, very simple. You know, surveillance, for example, is the number one activity of AI, face recognition, uh, giving you reports of what you might be thinking, that kind of thing. Monitoring remote areas of the office. Um, yeah, apart from that, it's, it's not really uh, being used. If you look at surveys of workers with AI, the majority of them will say that they are very worried that uh, they are going to lose their jobs. They are very, very worried they wouldn't understand what's going on, uh, which again is not justified. Uh, manufacturers say we're using it a lot when they're not. Workers say we're fearing it a lot when they shouldn't be. And, and it's all based on misinformation, I think, of what AI can do. Um, now, what's going to happen in the future? In the future, use, it will obviously um, uh, extend, increase. Currently, in fact, even finance, as, as some figures for finance, only 5% of transactions are given by AI. The other is just traditional person-to-person um, operations that, that give rise to it. Uh, the technology is not fully developed, but there is potential. There is no doubt that there is potential. So what do we expect from this potential? Well, take, uh, uh, take chat GPT. According to the Stanford AI report, it, it could affect all service sectors, all service occupations, except for the very, very top managerial ones. Um, the paralegals will be the first ones to go, and in fact, those aren't going, in fact, now. Uh, civil servants, programmers, programmers will go, most of them, because ChatGPT is better at writing uh, programs than, uh, than people. Um, and um, the implication is that, um, the main implication, actually, I think, is that the, the professions is what I said to you. I'm coming back to show that some professions have been affected. Pr professions need to rethink how they, um, how they um, organize themselves. Because currently, for example, if you want to become a lawyer, you would uh, go, to your, go to a legal school, graduate, then get a job as a paralegal, being paid very little, sometimes nothing at all, actually, in good uh, law firms in uh, London. And what you basically do is that you, have, you prepare reports for uh, um, senior lawyers of previous cases, similar cases, collect evidence, you do all those things, you spend lots of time, 
a week, two weeks doing it, and you give one report, and then the senior lawyer decides how to use the evidence and how to process it. Well, ChatGPT can do this kind of thing in two minutes, if at all, for you. So why do, why do you need the paradigms? You don't. And a lot of uh, law firms, in fact, in London, from what I'm told, are not hiring uh, paralegals anymore. Now, if you don't, then how do you become a senior lawyer? You cannot jump from school to seniority the way the profession is run unless they restructure it. And that's something that I'm not sure that they thought about. Uh, the same applies to accountants <coughs> and doing these basic calculations, and especially to civil servants. But uh, government is always the slowest one to respond. But uh, these junior ministry people that go into government economic service and other diplomatic services and so on will we, we lose their jobs. And I think, I think this is going to be the main implication of uh, AI technologies that are reaching the point where they can be applied. Now, is there going to be a job shortage? Well, there's no evidence at all of job shortage. In fact, currently, we have worker shortage, not job shortage. Employers, if you ask them, they, can, they cannot find workers, not jobs. And unemployment is not high. It's not because of mismatch. It's just that there aren't any people. The birth rates are down. We have aging societies. No jobs. So it's good if we encourage the use of the technology to um, take the jobs that um, the people who are not there cannot take. Um, now, where are they going to come from? Well, you shouldn't uh, worry about that because no economies, no any futurists have ever been good at guessing where new jobs will come from. It's basically because the human mind is too complicated to be uh, used, to, to be sort of put into a prediction of where jobs will come from. It's a human creativity. What you need to know is to provide the free market environment, give incentives for a private initiative to create the jobs, and they will, they will be created if you want to work. If you don't want to work, then you don't. You, um, you inherit lots of wealth, and you invest it in robotics, and you're OK. Uh, OK, now, what skills do I need to work in this new economy that uh, I described? This is where we have some new work. These are my new additions. What we did is that we took um, from um, a company called Azuna, the, um, the, they collect all the advertised jobs, both in the US and UK, actually. And um, according to the Office of National, National Statistics in Britain, they managed to uh, make, to um, have all 93% of all advertised jobs in the UK in a kind of user-friendly uh, format. And um, we got that for uh, six years, from 2016 to 22, We used the American classification that is used by what used to be called burning glass, now it's called light cast, and uh, classified uh, skills. And what we found, actually, is very similar to what uh, um, US research has found, especially there are two reports, one by Manpower Group and the other by McKinsey. A global institute that are very, very consistent with what uh, we're finding in Britain. And uh, the, these are the skills that, um, that uh, employers are asking for with the new technologies that we have. The column on the left are the most common skills that uh, employers want. The bold thing are the ones rising, but these 10 have been the same for all the six years that we had. And if you look at that, you'll see that number one is always communications. What they mean by communication is the ability of, uh, of a worker to communicate. You know, when they advertise for jobs, they say you should be able to communicate well with uh, superiors, uh, others working with you, with customers, which is basically language. You know, so it's reassuring in a sense to know that the main skill that employers want, is the, at least in Britain, is still the good use of the English language. Um, then management abilities, they want client services to build good relations with clients, assertiveness, not to hesitate on the one hand and on the other hand, just say what it is and be sure about it. Be, be able to offer good customer service, something that is lacking desperately in Britain in, 
in most, at least in my experience. Um, focus on getting solutions to any problems that customers tell you, not just refer them to someone else, which happens very, very frequently in Britain again. <laughs> you move from one, uh, let me pass you on to someone else who knows about these things, and then you go. And, and then data analysis uh, comes fairly down, but, but it's rising. Be able to do sales, engineering, and food services are, the, the, are mainly deliveries. Uh, you know, to be able to deal with food uh, delivery. Now, the ones on the right are interesting as well, because at the same time, we asked what are the skills that um, were, they were not there in 2016, but they are there in, in 2022. So in that six-year period, are there any new skills that employers want? And we classify them into their category, and there almost everything is IT. In, um, in 2016, the only IT skills that employers wanted was the ability to work with Microsoft uh, Office, to be able to enter figures in, uh, in Microsoft Excel and use uh, Microsoft Word to, to web process. Now the main uh, IT skills that is rising and rising is Amazon Web Services, which I had no idea that it, it, it was this guy. I, I thought Amazon just sold boxes full of things. <laughs> but apparently they're much bigger in providing business services. And that's a skill that not many people have. I would certainly wouldn't be able to get that kind of job. Client on, onboarding, development operations, I don't know what they are. CI, CD, I don't know what they are. Cybersecurity is, is important. Uh, AI, talent acquisition is the first non-IT uh, skill which comes from the human resources and logical reasoning, which comes under social leadership and critical thinking on the American def definitions. I don't know what TypeScript is. It must be some kind of language. Do you know what TypeScript is? No? Good. I'm not alone. It's a language, is it? Oh, it is. Uh, all right. I, yeah. Now you know why I don't have a website. <laughs> and, and machine learning. And that's quite, and that's quite interesting. If you really want a job in the service economy, that, that's what you need to learn. If you're a little bit more uh, risk-loving and you don't care learning something new, then go for one of these. <laughs> that's, the, that's the moral of this uh, story here. Um, so the ever-present skills then, which are asked by about 80% of job addresses, what's traditionally known as soft skills or, or business skills. I, I don't, I don't and many others don't like the term soft skills, but we have, still haven't come up with something better. In fact, it's pretty hard, actually, to be a good communicator and, and, uh, and creative and all that, so I don't know why it's called a soft, um, which is mainly, as I said before, communicating with supervisors, peers, or supporting as reliability and self-discipline, creativity, critical thinking, leadership, management, advanced communication, and negotiation skills. Th those are the things that get you a good job and uh, make, you make the transition. Um, so you don't need to learn much IT. That's the point, despite the digital revolution. Uh, and, uh, and, and that's what's telling you. you know, data processing is essential. In fact, it's the only IT skill that uh, appears in the most uh, uh, popular skills. Learn how to uh, understand data, how to look at data and analyze it and discover things that others haven't. And once you do it, then you go and communicate it to your uh, colleagues and, your, and you use it for your clients and all that. So in that sense, we know why these companies are the most successful companies in, in, in the world, these digital, big digital companies, because they're, they're the ones who have the data. And um, I mean, I wrote, I wrote a short project this, uh, syndicate article, and in fact, even a book I collaborated on, a, a guy who works in a data company outside academia, uh, claiming that, um, that they should make their data public. We call it quantum, I can't even remember the type, quantum governance. I, I think that's probably the, um, if there is any action that I can increase social welfare just uh, instantly, is to 
is for uh, Google, Tencent, Amazon, Alibaba to make their data publicly available. You just go to their website and download anything you want. Yeah, if, if I were a, a dictator, that's what I would ask, a benevolent dictator, that's what I would, that, that would be my first action. Uh, beyond that, I don't know, let them make, let, beyond that, the next best thing you can do is buy their shares. <laughs> what can I say? Yeah. Um, so, you see, once you have the data, you need to communicate the results, that's who we're discovering. Customers are getting more sophisticated through higher education. You need people uh, who know how to get customer support to recruit successful companies, uh, work collaboratively with their workers down the line. You, you don't succeed by sending commands to your employees and expect them to follow them, which is what we used to do. You collaborate, you treat them as stakeholders, you discuss what the company needs, they know, uh, and, um, and that's what the most successful companies do. Um, the, um, in terms of sectors of the economy, expect health and hospitality to uh, create more and more jobs because they are what you might call luxuries. When um, we get a uh, rise in income, we usually spend a bigger proportion of that on health and hospitality than any other sector. Um, I mean, look at Americans, they are spending 18% of their GDP on average on health. In uh, Europe, we spend about 12% on health. In China, they spend about 5 to 6% on health. As it develops, that would increase more and more. Um, and uh, we need to rethink the quality of jobs if we are going to uh, reduce the stress that AI is giving to workers. So the final topic, it would be very quick actually, I want to tell you about the quality, of, uh, the quality because now we have a new kind of research area, in fact, is what you, it's fairly new in economics, is what is called well-being. It used to be called happiness uh, research, but we switched to using it as well-being research. One of the leaders there, in fact, is my colleague and friend Richard Laird at the London School of Economics, and Andrew Oswald, actually, also a friend, although not a colleague in a different university. And uh, we have a lot of information on, from what might be called happiness surveys or what people think about work. And um, there are things that you might find as paradoxes, like losing your job is one of the life events that gives most unhappiness. Um, the other, the two life events that give as much or more unhappiness is uh, illness or death in the family and divorce. I'm always astonished that divorce gives so much unhappiness, but uh, as, as much as losing your job and someone dying, if I, I think, um, yeah, I always say that when they do these surveys, they should uh, differentiate between divorce with the help of lawyers and divorce without lawyers. And divorce with lawyers will be even more unhappy than this. <laughs> anyway, forget that. Um, the, but, but then, Okay, people are very unhappy about losing their job, but they are also not happy performing work. So, so, so work is like, you're not happy doing it, but you are even less happy not having it, which is, which is the apparent contra contradiction. So obviously you don't want people to stop working to make them more happy, because they want to have work. But you should be able to improve conditions at work to make them happier doing the work. Uh, in fact, the, 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 and, and it's, it's obvious where improvement needs to be. Now, they, they hate commuting. That, that's understandable. It, you know, you, we need to improve communication in crowded spaces. But, but next to commuting, they hate seeing their boss. That's obviously something that, can, that's the boss's fault. You know, the boss should make work a friendly place, a friendly environment. So, so the worst thing that could happen to your work is to be, is to get on the MTR system or, or in the London Underground, discover that the trains are not running well, you arrive at work totally exhausted, exhausted, stressed, you don't know what to do, and you find a piece of paper on your desk saying, 
the boss wants to see you at 10 o'clock. <laughs> You're almost dead for the day. Um, now, when um, you, yeah, in fact, if you, there, I mean, the, this, this, these two guys, McCarran, actually, is, oh no, McCarran, they, they've done some very good work, which is reported in that new book on well-being by Layard, where, where they ask, they actually ask me to put um, the computed prices on um, different activities that people do during the day. You know, how much would you give? You know, given your normal, given a normal day, how much would you give to um, perform another activity? you know, which is the one that gives happiness, or how much do you want to be paid to do an activity that is, doesn't give you enough happiness? The, the one that has the highest price that you want to, that you will pay to avoid, is being sick in bed. You know, I, I think they priced it, I, I don't know what units they use, they price it something like uh, 45 pen, no, 45 pounds during a typical day. Is if you are healthy and you are leading a normal day, and now I tell you you are going to be sick unless you pay some money, how much are you prepared to pay? You say I'll give you forty-five pounds and keep my health. The next one is uh, is, is is work that they that gives the most unhappiness. That uh, which is it's way below is something like twelve pounds for someone else to go and do your work, I guess. <laughs> yeah, which surprises me is little. I mean, I don't know. It's, um, and so on. So how can we improve work? Well, that's what workers say before they say more money. In fact, more money will not give them more happiness. It, it will give them a margin of happiness. What they say is that they, um, they'd like to have better communication with managers supporting aides. That's where they see your boss comes in. If you have better communication with uh, your manager, then you're not going to be stressed when the boss wants to see you. Um, more transparency about company policy. That's also related to uh, seeing the boss because the thing that worries them, about, worries them about seeing the boss is that they might be fired. Whereas if you know what, what company policy is, you will know whether you're going to be fired or not. Uh, better social relations with, with colleagues, uh, you know, buying a good coffee machine, and having a room, especially for people to go for breaks, helps a lot to improve well-being at work. And, um, and the last one, which is uh, gaining more and more important, especially after COVID, is more time flexibility, working from home, and the, the ability to work from home in the four-day week, which is a, lot, a little bit more difficult. Now, these, let me see. No, yeah, I don't have it. The, these. They would definitely remove the stress from workers. They are important to implement. Um, I've seen some work. I've, I've, I've seen a report that was based on a meeting in London with the employers, the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry. To, to my astonishment, everyone who spoke from CBI, they, they, they responded by saying, well, of course, we know about this, and they would like it more, but it's just impossible to implement. You know, we, we don't know how to do it. We cannot do it. And, and that's, basically, that's basically the problem. British managers go and they get trained in Oxford, Cambridge, public schools, and all that, and they never talk to workers. The only people down the line and skill that they talk to might be the taxi driver to tell them where to take them. So when it comes to employing people, in their office, they, they, they feel even more stressed when they come into contact with workers than their workers do when they don't come into contact with them. And that's the big problem. How do you educate people to be more of that? Americans actually are much better with, with that kind of thing than, than the Brits are. Uh, in fact, these successful companies doing that, there are American companies that uh, also provide something like um, 75, minimum 75 hours a year uh, for uh, training uh, by the workers through the intranet uh, system so that they acquire the new skills. Um, okay, well, I'll finish and, and, and take questions. Now, first, should we regulate AI? I think, we, I think we definitely should. I mean, I don't know myself very much. You know, I'm by nature optimist. I'm not 
scared of it, but when you see some old man uh, say AI should be regulated because it's dangerous, you um, see London having the first uh, leaders, country leaders summit on how to control AI. Uh, Jeff Hinton, known as the godfather of AI, resigned from Google because of the risks that AI has with the data that Google have. You go to the Hong Kong Science Museum and you see that AI is closer to the midnight of uh, humanity than uh, nuclear uh, weapons. See, there is a very interesting dial, actually. I don't know if you've seen it at the Hong Kong Science Museum. We only saw it earlier this week. That um, there is a dial that you, you, you choose whatever, you know, nuclear war, environmental damage, and all that. And if you hit 12, it's the end of the world. Well, AI will take you within seconds of 12. <laughs> I, I, I don't know who would dream that one up, but it's very interesting. Um, so we do need to regulate it, but we don't know how. It's a very interesting book by, uh, called The World of AI by Henry Kissinger when he was 99. He, he died recently, as you probably know. And um, Schmidt, Eric Schmidt, the founder of Google, and the head of uh, MIT Computing, whose name I don't know, and, and, and it's very interesting. They go through the history of AI, what it can do, and in the end they say it would be impossible to regulate, and it's very dangerous. Because it's software. How, how do you regulate the use of software? You, you cannot monitor it. And um, if anyone comes up with that idea, they, they'll save the world. So, <laughs> and, and it's worrying when you see all these things. Apart from that, we're still in its early stages. We must make sure that it's applied well. Uh, I don't know how. <laughs> and um, at least when it comes to well-being at work and reducing the stress that AI is giving you, you need collaboration between companies and government, but main, mainly companies should do it. It's, it's mainly, the, the onus is on to uh, company managers, actually, which I don't know, maybe management schools or business schools should um, start teaching this kind of thing on how to uh, train managers to uh, uh, not to be scared to socialize with their workers. As we socialize with students, managers should socialize, socialize with workers. OK, thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you, uh, Sir Chris, for a very uh, interesting talk. So now the, we uh, have time, okay, for questions. Okay. This is a self-vested question. I have a relatively younger daughter, and question I have two two areas. One is, would one be optimistic that this wave of AI would bring better equality between the wealthy and the poor. And second question I have is relating to my banker's uh, uh, boss, Jamie Dimon. He said uh, with the approach of AI, there might be uh, younger workers because they only work four days a week, as you said, and they don't do a lot of routine work. They, they might live until 100 years old. Mm. Would that be... How would you think of those two sort of implications or conclusions? Thank you. I mean, if, 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 if you're a super optimist, you <laughs> might believe that. The, um, the, the, the latter, if, uh, if AI is giving you, or is giving the stress that it's giving that we know from the data, you're going to live less than uh, what you're living now, actually, than, than 100 than by staying at home. Because as we know, mental health is not Poor mental health is not conducive to a long uh, uh, lifetime. Um, so, so it depends how you do it. If you, if, if in addition to working fewer hours, you took action to improve well-being at work, and then obviously well-being does extend uh, life expectancies. Um, I, I mean, I know of some work. I can't remember where it was that the. Uh, 
where they use life expectancy as the health outcome of, uh, of conditions at work. And there was a positive relation, you know, like unemployment. If there's too high unemployment, long-term unemployment, for example, you get uh, lower expectancy. But, uh, you know, because you know that... Uh, you know that there are only two countries which uh, have lost uh, life expectancy, and our life expectancy is shorter than it was 10 years ago, which is America and Russia. Russia because of alcoholism mainly, and America because of opiates, which is ang what Angustito has been writing about. Now, if, if, if they resort to uh, drugs of that kind because of uh, a stressful life and all that, then and it's usually the unemployed, actually, that suffer from it. So you wouldn't be consistent with what you said. Um, now, on, on whether on equality, I think, I think AI will cause more inequalities than what we have now, because all the power is concentrated in the hands of a few. I, 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 mean, just, I mean, just look at the companies. You know, like when, um, say, say look, look at the immediate aftermath of the electricity revolution. We needed to supply, um, not we needed, I mean, there was demand for uh, all these electrical appliances in the home and um, the industry to electrify and everything. And um, that brought the expansion of the next 50 years, the fast growth rates that we got, first uh, starting with uh, America, but then uh, uh, Britain, continental Europe, and so on. Well, there were many companies supplying those things. It wasn't just one company supplying everything. You know, even even the motor car. It was uh, Ford was a leader, but he wasn't the, he, he wasn't the only one. Uh, look at the digital revolution. It, it's, it's basically one company for each. You know, Google is unique. I know there is Microsoft are trying very very hard to break into their monopoly, but but. Google is still used by 80% of uh, digital search uh, for, for goods. Amazon is, is unique, you know, like I suspect it will be the same elsewhere, but in Britain, so many others try to break in to their uh, monopoly of selling. But why would you? You just click Amazon at uh, 10 in the evening and the packet arrives next, uh, next day. So th that increases inequality enormously when it's all concentrated in, in one company. And that's what digital uh, companies do, that, that, that the bigger the company, the better the digital service they are offering. Whereas when you look at refrigerators, for example, it's not necessarily the case that the bigger the company producing refrigerators, the better service you're going to get. In fact, if anything, you get a worse service when they're too big. They don't manage the logistics very well. So I wouldn't agree with the first statement, and probably I wouldn't agree with the second, actually, either. <laughs> That's it. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first, thank you so much for giving the talk today. So I'm a PhD student in the management department. Um, so of course, I'm pretty new in the whole like AI and research area. Um, so I'm just curious about, because you mentioned that uh, using robot in manufacturing didn't necessarily, <clears throat> didn't necessarily decrease the amount of employment in manu manufacturing in um, the focal country. So it just kind of steal the employments from other countries. But you also mentioned that there are two types of products, right? The first one is like the physical goods. So there is a saturation for physical good, and then there's also services. Um, and uh, there's not yet a saturation for services. So I'm just wondering, how do you think the use of AI would kind of shape or change the export of services, like instead of the export of, of goods? So for instance, like, mm. um, the export of consulting services, because there are already cases where like AI is better in providing uh, consulting advices than some of the consultants. So do you think 
potentially adopting um, AI in service industry would kind of change the export of service to just the export of technology. Mm. Yeah, that, that, yeah, that's a good point, actually. I, I think trading services would definitely increase with uh, digital technologies and with AI because they're, they're exportable. I mean, you don't, you don't need to be in the same location to uh, make use of a lot of the services that is coming from AI. And in fact, it's already, it's already the, case that the, the case that you are not. You know, like uh, if you look at within the European Union, for example, Ireland is a, is a huge exporter of services, mainly American digital services, because they locate there, because they have lower taxes and, uh, and, and they export to the whole of Europe. And uh, that that will become even more and more uh, common. In, in fact, um, th there is already there is already trading of services. The you know the biggest service that's being exported is tourism, of course. You know, like you sell to foreigners, and that I, that would that would change very much with AI. But business services though would would change. Now the um, the, the big the big accountancy firms, management companies, go and locate somewhere. You know, like McKinsey's have offices in every country of the world you can imagine. But with uh, AI and and more of this technology and, and the you know Zoom technologies and all that, it should be it should be possible to uh, close down offices and operate from central offices abroad. Yeah, good point. So. No. Okay, so question over there. Um, firstly, thanks for your talk. It's very thought provoking. And I'm a freshman, so I may not have the best questions here, but um, about the part where the about the part where robot, where countries utilizing robotics are stealing jobs from others that didn't use it that much on the manufacturing sectors, what will what will this have a effects on those that are developing and industrializing, like for example Bangla Bangladesh or Nigeria, where they may are they, where they may be uh, have industrial industrializing, but they might not have the most amount of resources to capitalize on the robotics part. Yeah, well, well, <laughs> they're going to have problems, more problems. The, uh, you see, the, the, like the, the, the route that China followed for industrialization, which is basically the old fashioned route, but more intense, uh, is is no longer available. I think I, I I don't think big countries like uh, Nigeria or, or or even the Asian like Indonesia, Philippines, and all that can uh, industrialize by relying on low cost uh, labor and uh, attracting foreign investment to produce labor intensive goods because um, it's becoming more and more mechanized. And uh, the big countries are even uh, giving up on supply chains and taking it back to their countries. I think the only way th they do it is by is by going directly to the digital technologies. But you said they don't have the money to buy the robots, but in fact they are not they are not expensive. The, the, the digital technologies, you know, like I I mean I haven't read as much as uh, I wanted to, but um, I think Kenya, for example, is becoming. A, Big digital exporter, from what I was reading briefly. Um, I mean, a lot of the a lot of the technology is mobile technology anyway, and, and that's very inexpensive. It's the, you see, China when when China was industrializing, it needed massive inflows of foreign capital to uh, foreign investments to buy the capital. Uh, because although Chinese people saved a lot, and they are still saving a lot, too much in fact, um, it was still not enough to buy the heavy equipment that you needed for the engineering and motor car industry and all that. Whereas, in the, uh, whereas with dig digital technologies, you don't need the money. So I think their best uh, chance of development is to, um, is to go directly for the digital um, technology. And develop companies and develop 
technologies and products that will have an international market. Easier said than done, of course, but that's it. There's a question over there. Uh, thank you for the presentation. My name is David. Uh, I'm a master's student in public policy, and I have an undergraduate degree in economics. However, uh, labor economics is not my you. best performing <laughs> discipline. So uh, I hope that I understand your literature right. So I took the liberty to read your uh, essay with the title, uh, Unemployment Response to Skill Bias uh, Sharks which is, uh, I guess, 25 years ago. And one of the, one of the implications is that uh, unemployment insurance benefits and uh, aggressive employment protection will disincentivize job uh, creation. Uh, so what would be the uh, innovative policy alternatives uh, that can uh, balance between uh, protecting labor's well-being, and at the same time, facilitating uh, job transition. And mm. my second question. Uh, can, can, can I say the first quickly question. before you, because I'm going to forget. I, I think there actually we have a solution. It's basically what uh, Denmark and Netherlands and other countries are doing. Be, be, be generous for six months to give people uh, the chance to uh, uh, adjust uh, quickly, search the market, find what uh, they need. But, and they're going to do it if you give the, if they know that after six months or maybe nine or, or, or a year, but not more than a year, you're going to stop this uh, assistance. And they're not, they're not going to let you starve, but they're going to force you into a, a program, a training program, which involves work at the same time. And we know that, I mean, that's been going on for a while in those countries. And we know from research they've done that um, the the threat of a threat of a program is a big incentive for people to to make sure they find a job quickly. Uh, but, uh, of course, provided the country is not stagnating. But as I was saying, it's a shortage of workers we have, not uh, people. The reason being that um, that th these programs. Uh, they, they don't differentiate between people's different skills. They, they send you into one and you have to do it. Whereas if you choose it yourself, you're going to choose something. You're going to self-select. You're going to choose something that you enjoy doing. So there is a solution to that one. Thank you. And my second question is that um, I myself have been lucky to, to have an internship uh, in, in business development at an AI company. Uh, although I'm not, I, I did not major in any of the IT uh, majors. So uh, I would like to ask for uh, the majority of, of university students, maybe in Hong Kong or worldwide. So what would be a, how, how should we prepare for a, if we decided to pursue a career in an AI company, how can we be on board? What, what preparation we should do? If, if you want a career in AI, uh, actually, I, I, I had a slide of that, but I didn't put it up because it, it, there was too much. Uh, I mean, you should obviously have a basic knowledge of the skills that I, that I mentioned uh, before. Uh, data, data analytics is the most important because if you go for, um, uh, to become, to learn a lot of programming, to, um, learn how to develop AI and, and, and move the frontier, then uh, you're likely to fail. Uh, not, not, you, not because of your personal qualities that might be <laughs> very, very high, but too many, too many people are going into that because it's more exciting. You know, I mean, they all want to be the next Bill Gates and the next Elon Musk. Right? I mean, it's understandable, but uh, you know, for each, uh, Elon Musk, there are probably a million aspiring Elon Musks that never made it. Um, and, uh, and in fact, with the passage of, of time, the numbers will be even bigger because you are going to develop a technology that will be able to take your job. That's what AI can do. You know, it's the ultimate Frankenstein's monster. You. Um, 
you, you, you develop, you become a real expert in programming. You write this fantastic AI program, and what's the first thing that it does? It becomes an even better programmer than you are. So it's gone. So I wouldn't advise you to go into programming. Learn about data. Numbers are wonderful things. Become a number theorist. That's what you know. <laughs> like, like the famous uh, Hardy, who one of the, probably the most famous number theorist in Britain, where he said, nothing, nothing I do will ever have any use to anyone. How wrong can it be? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what you need to know now. <laughs> okay. How about over there? Thank you, Professor Pizaridis. Um, I have two questions. One is that uh, it seems like most of your assumption on uh, uh, you know, the robots uh, being a bit slow on the adoption is that it actually happened in an industrial uh, setting. But uh, the recent observation is that it seems like the, you know, the, the large language model transformers are actually connecting the dots on the, on the bigger brain. So it helps, helps the robots uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, digest the, the, the task and then, and, and then make it quicker. Uh, and so they can probably perform in a more complex environment and probably also in an environment where uh, it's less standardized, like industrial settings. Um, so uh, that's, there are a lot of investments in embodied AI. So my question here is, so given the assumptions that you have in the, in the con conclusion, what are some of the, uh, the assumptions that you think, you know, given the technological advances, there might be uh, you know, something we have to, you know, revisit, uh, you know, for example, like what I just mentioned. And along with that, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> it, we, we've talked about on the other side of the, the coin was uh, on autonomous driving, we've been talking about it for the last 10 years, but uh, it's very deflationary. So uh, price is the same, quantity the same, the share of the, 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 the robotics is the same, but then it has gone nowhere. So it's mainly because of the development of the cost is really, really too high. So um, my question then is, um, if there are certain ways that, uh, you know, the AI could probably lower the point, the cost to a certain point, and have you guys look into like maybe where the break-even point is, then uh, in my, you know, just, you know, follow what Elon Musk was saying, that we will have a 2030, you know, singularity moment. Thank you. Mm -hmm. No, I, that, that, that's, a, that's a very difficult thing to do, actually, to, to, to work out. I mean, are you saying work out how low the cost has, has to be before we adopt it? I see it, it would be impossible for anyone to do. I mean, basically what you do, you, what, what you need to start off with, you know, the, the low-hanging fruit, as it were, is, um, is, is the capabilities. What, what can they do? What can AI do? And if you can um, show that it can do certain services more efficiently, then the cost of those you know, uh, they're going to fall. But, um, but whether it would be adopted, you don't know. Actually, I don't know if it's relevant, but I've seen some, there's been some work by the IMF recently that, um, they, um, they, they, they ask the similar question, but from a different point of view. You know, at what point do you take over? And, and they, they kind of con concluded that uh, the, the spread, although AI might be growing in theory, the spread of it and, and the market use would be much more limited because of social norms. People prefer to um, do... Uh, Certain things with people rather than uh, rather than machinery. However low the cost of the machinery, they, they, they were using an example which uh, I think was rather unfortunate, which was that uh, you know, for, for example, if you have some uh, problem for a lawyer or something, you know that there is AI that can solve your problem because AI will know the law better. He said most people trust the lawyer more than a machine. I'm quite astonished the IMF would say that. In fact, lawyer, 
Lawyers is a profession that most people mistrust more than any other profession. <laughs> so they said, so if, if you have a problem with the law, you're not going to sit in the computer, type something, and AI will come up with the answer, which I think that because you trust more. If, if they use medicine, as they, you know, we know that AI is being applied extensively in the medical profession. But if you are, if you are sick and you want to get some medication or some diagnosis. I bet you anything, however low the cost of, uh, of you doing it by yourself and um, some AI, AI program coming up and telling you, you have such and such a problem and we recommend this medicine, print this that it was recommended by us and take it to a pharmacist and you get it. Pe people will not do it. They will still be prepared to pay a medical person to do it. Whereas when it comes to something very similar, which I used extensively, in fact, when I look after my plants in the London, that it tells me, this plant looks sick, you need to apply such and such a thing to it to look healthier. I do it, I don't go and pay someone to <laughs> give me direct advice. I go to the, uh, the garden center, as we call it, I buy that thing, I give it to the plant. If it dies, I just replace it. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's not only the, the, the cost, yeah. Okay, so let's have uh, the last question. Okay. Uh, hey, uh, my research is mainly in the area for organization behavior and human resource management. So uh, the one example you gave here really resonates with me, you know, you're talking about these uh, senior civil servants and, and lawyers, right? Mm -hmm. And these lower level jobs were replaced. So the, then the challenge is really in the future, right? We still need people with the top skills. But when you have these lower, this lower levels, jobs were removed, how, how do you really train people, prepare them? I'll give you one example for doing research, right? We don't let the PhD students to have RA when they're PhD students. We don't let the postdoc right mm -hmm. to have RA, because you you need to actually do those what we call perhaps a more routine and lower level skills of mm -hmm. uh, those work in order to for you to actually grow uh, to become an experienced, high skilled uh, researcher, right? Uh, uh, including like a coding data, right? <laughs> you know, those sort of very time consuming kind of work, right? Because eventually how you interpret work is really related, also related how you coded the data, all, all those things mm -hmm. involved. So how do we actually, uh, we want more people, right? At the top, top skill, right? But then how do we actually prepare them when we have this lower level skills eliminated and the people don't get a chance to do it? Yeah, uh, are people high skilled people created from vacuum? I thought that was the question that I asked. You're asking me the same question. <laughs> Just an open question for everybody to discuss, and perhaps we can brainstorm some ideas. No, no, it's, very, it's very simple. Yeah. You're raising the AI. Yeah. You, you replace the exactly. You, you get to the point where you replace the senior people as well. But I. But 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 seriously, I. I asked the question, where is it? It's somewhere, uh, somewhere. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, there you are, yeah, yeah, yeah. This one, see? It's up to the professions to uh, solve it. This, this, is, this is very expensive um, professional advice. I can't give it free. <laughs> <laughs> to tell the lawyers how to organize their office. Did, we ever, did you ever get anything free from a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. All right. So I don't the, know if you ask. Okay, let's okay, thank the, the, Sir Chris again. Yeah. <laughs>